Thanks very much, band, and thank you, AV team, too. So, Greg, over to you. Oh, well, what a privilege and blessing to be here with you uh, today. I feel like I've already been blessed. Thank you so much for that time of worship. And um, isn't, isn't the Holy Spirit incredible the way he, he encounters us? And even though we're together or dispersed, I, uh, it's amazing how, how, how good God is, is to us. Uh, uh, so as, as previously mentioned, I am Greg. And you know what? I am a bit of a mixture. So uh, let me tell you about my Friday. Um, on Friday morning, I got a text message from someone. And it was one of those slightly snotty, passive-aggressive text messages that uh, it just... It's the sort of thing that's really, it's the sort of really annoying text that you get. I was supposed to be my day off, and I was like, oh. And I could feel my internal world getting all sort of uh, stirred up, and um, I could feel sort of growing angst. And do you know what? I responded to that in a really godly way. Um, I can't often say this, but I did. Um, I took some time, I prayed it through. I asked the Lord to show me what I needed to forgive, where I just needed to be, uh, to turn from my own brokenness in it as well. And um, having prayed it through, I was able to just send a really encouraging text message to this person. And there may need to be a bit of follow up, um, but, uh, but I was just like, it's like, man, I've nailed that. Do you know what I mean? That was, that was godly, mature behavior. The behavior of the kind of person that's been a Christian for 18 years and walked with the Lord. And, and seen, seen God's goodness break, in their, break out in their life. The other thing that happened on Friday morning was that um, I totally lost it and my kids to such an extent that I could see they were all treading on eggshells around me because um, they could see that dad was being a little bit grumpy slash volatile. I'm Greg and I'm a bit of a mixture. And I don't know if any, any of you sort of have similar sort of things. You have that, that sort of sense of, uh, I see the truth of who God has called me to be break out in my life. And it's elating. It's great. It's, 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 it's a beautiful thing to see. And then I see almost Greg of old, the flesh, the, the flesh man, my, my brokenness, rear its, rear its head. Um, I think that sense of, now and not yetness that I see in my own identity has only been enhanced by lockdown, only been, um, um, I, has, con has confronted me even more um, during these COVID, COVID times. I think COVID really has confronted people with who they are. And, you know, in a, in a church setting, in a Christian setting, we're, we often when we think about that question, who am I? Um, it's an identity question. And we know the right theological answer to that question, right? Um, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God um, in whom he, he, he's, he loves me. He's already well pleased with me. That is the spiritual theological truth that sits over each and every one of us if we've said yes to Jesus. That is, that is an absolute reality. And then there's the way I, I live. There's that spirituality and there's the practical relational material reality about how I conduct myself um, day to day with friends, family, um, the things that I do in secret, the, you know, it's just, it's just that I see, I see my mess. There's this gap between who God says I am and how I actually behave. And I don't know about you, but I, I just want to see that gap close. I want that separation to get much, much smaller. And um, that's what I want to spend a bit of time thinking about today. How do, we, how do we narrow the gap between who God says we are and who we actually, um, who, who, who we, how we can behave like? And so we're going to look at um, 1 John 1. So um, get that marked in your Bible. It's towards the back in the, in the New Testament. Um, 1 John 1. And then I'm just going to give us one simple practice that hopefully will allow us to put into um, in place in our life as one thing that's going to help us narrow that gap between who God says we are and how we can sometimes behave. So 1 John 1 is written to the church in Ephesus 
And it's, uh, it's written to uh, a people who are struggling with a particular heresy known as a, a, a Gnostic heresy, which basically meant that people thought that the spirit was good and that matter and the body was evil. And the, the outworking of that heresy in the life of this particular church was that they were questioning whether or not Jesus really um, was God in the flesh. And um, one of the, the sort of um, arguments that have been put forward was that Jesus didn't actually come in, in the flesh because how, how can God, who's good, come and take, um, uh, take, the for, take material form when matter's bad? And so what they said was, oh no, Jesus um, only pretended to have a body because matter's evil. And then there was a discipleship implication for that as well, because, well, if the matter's, if matter's bad, then it either needs to be punished. So people will, some people at one end of the spectrum would really sort of punish their bodies, um, very harsh regimes of fasting and that sort of stuff. But the more common end of the spectrum and at the other end of it was, it's like, well, the matter doesn't matter. Um, we can do whatever we want with our bodies. We'll just indulge our appetites. We'll eat what we want. We drink what we want. We'll sleep with whoever we, we want to because it doesn't matter what we do with our bodies. And you can see um, that in this letter, they're picking up this tension between um, uh, a spiritual truth and a physical reality that people are, are living in. And, and so the, this letter of John is trying to say, is trying to close that gap, trying to, trying to get rid of this separation between, oh, you can have a spiritual truth and a physical reality that's different. And, and so you get verses in it, like 1 John, um, 1 John 4, verse 19 and 20, it says um, that um, if you love God, but hate your brother, you're a liar. Because love for God must, it must flesh itself out. It must cash out in our relationships and the way we treat each other. I'm, I'm desperate for that separation to be closed. closed. I'm hung, hungry for it. Um, just as those, those people in the church in Ephesus were being challenged to have that gap closed. And so let me just read to you from 1 John 1. We can start... Um, Here's the first, first four verses. This is what it says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And you can hear it there. That it's speaking into this particular heresy. Um, G Jesus really did come. He really was a man. It's what we've seen and heard. It's what we've touched. We've had this physical encounter with God incarnate and it's been so profound that as we proclaim it to you what we've seen and heard so you can have fellowship with us the the result of that fellowship with us and we have fellowship with God himself that's that's so profound that's so um all-consuming that your joy will be made complete man I'm after that I'm after that and then it goes on verse five this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness. God is light, God is the one that makes things visible. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in, in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Light makes things visible, but darkness is all about trying to keep things hidden. And then verse seven, it goes on and says, but if, we, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. But if just as Jesus made the invisible God visible, we allow God and people to see who we are, 
then we have true friendship with each other, fellowship with each other, and who Jesus is and what he's done for us on the cross. It takes a more, it takes a deeper root in our lives. And then verse eight, it goes on. But if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we, if we pretend we haven't sinned, we're, we're just deluded about, about who we are. Uh, verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. In this letter, as it's been spoken to a people that have a separate, have separated out a spiritual truth with a practical reality, what the writer is doing is saying, as you confess your brokenness before God, before each other, you are cleansed, you are washed clean, you are purified from that unrighteousness. And God's forgiveness, his love can flow afresh in your life in a, in a deeper, in a deeper way. And so my one action for us today, my one practical, how do we deal with the gap? My one practice for us is, is that of confession. Now, I'm going to offer you, though, confession three ways, okay? Confession three ways. And um, before I go further, I do, I do just want to say, don't worry, I'm not going to drag us back into um, the land of um, going to see a priest in a box and you've got to um, share stuff with him there. Um, but I, I, I do want to say that we, firstly, confession, first of, the first of confession three ways is that we need to confess our sin, confess our brokenness to God. That, that very practical act, act helps us narrow the gap a little while back i went on retreat as, as soon as the uh, as soon as the uh, the roads were open back into wales i went on retreat and i, I went on retreat because I, I was longing to get some discernment on some particular strategic issues we had going on as a church um, i don't feel like in the end god spoke to me about any of that stuff but what he did do was speak right to my heart and one of the first things that happened on my retreat was I wrote down a list of all the things that I would rather do than spend time with God. Now it's a I suppose in some ways it feels like a shocking admission for a vicar to say oh you know there's there's things that I would do rather than pray um, but there it is and so I wrote down all this sort of stuff. Um, uh, I'd rather have a couple of cold draft lagers. I'd rather um, watch um, uh, the next episode of uh, Grey's Anatomy on Net uh, on, um, on on Disney Star. Um, I'd rather eat some nice food. And um, part of my confession before God was, if I'm honest, Lord, too often those things feel more satisfying than spending time with you. And I, I was writing, Lord. You, I, I want to believe that you are the superior pleasure in life, but that just isn't my current experience. And I feel like a failure as a Christian. I feel like a failure as a vicar and a father who wants to lead his, his family into um, a deeper relationship with you because that's my experience. But there it is. That, that is how I feel. You see... Satan wants us to be deluded about our sin, to pretend it's not there. And sometimes we just need to take real time and say, before God, this is what's going on in my heart. And it is, there's some darkness in there. Satan wants us deluded about our sin, but we can use it as prayer fodder, as fuel that draws us back to the Lord to, to taste and see again, they know that he is good. But of course, what can't happen is that we go back to, uh, we go to God with our sin and our brokenness and we just indulge it. 
we have to take the opportunity to step into freedom. I don't, I don't want to be deluded about my sin, but I also don't want to be defeated by it. And so if confession one is confess your stuff to God, own your stuff before God, actually take the time to speak to him about it and not just assume he knows, process it with him, then confession two is we need to confess our brokenness to each other. As part of that retreat, I had factored in calls with some of my prayer partners. And I was, I was just talking to them about the fact that I've, I, ha- I feel like this. I'm dissatisfied with the, my level of connection with God to such an extent that so many other things look way more appealing. And so in that kind of accountability space, what, all, what often comes back though is, not only do I see myself, see, see what and hear what I'm saying for what it is, the challenge comes back. Okay, are you happy with that? What do you want to do about that? And so the accountable plan off the back of my retreat was that I'm going to try and memorize Philippians, the whole, the whole, whole, the whole book. Because in that book, there's such a sense from the Apostle Paul, who's writing it from prison, that Jesus really is the source of his contentment. Jesus really is the superior pleasure of his life. And I know I want that. I don't want to leave my family in that and my church into that. So I'm going to just do all I can to digest that scripture, to, for allow it to allow it to take root in who I am. So we need to confess to God. We need to confess to each other. And then the third type of confession is that we need to confess Jesus to our world. If we want to narrow the gap, if we want to narrow the gap, part of that journey is to um, to lift up our eyes and take our eyes off ourselves and see that God is at work in the world around us. One of the issues with thinking and and speaking about confession is it can make us a little bit self-absorbed and self-focused. And one of the ways in which we try and combat that at our church is that we have a, uh, we're trying to embed a practice that we just call pray for three, which is literally as part of any accountability group or as part of any small group that we have going on. We say it finishes by spending time praying for three people in your life that you, that you want to see become Christians. And then, um, on a daily basis, praying for those same three people. And um, I, so I, I get a text from somebody each day saying, have you prayed for your three? Have you prayed for your three today? And that, and that prayer is like, Lord, um, uh, who, who do I need to invite to the next Alpha course? Just like, just show me, or how can I invite this person to the next Alpha course? What's, what's going to give them the best chance of uh, saying yes? And so there is some, there is part of it, which is we're, we're interceding before God for them to, to see salvation. But we're also asking a question like, God, what do I need to do next to allow this, this prayer, this spiritual thing that I've spoken out to actually become a practical reality that I can partner with you in? And so before the last Alpha course, I was praying for a, a, a friend of mine and I felt like God just said to me, um, uh, I was asking him, what, what should I do next? And he, said, and he said, oh, take him a bottle of wine. And so it was in the middle of lockdown, so I took him a bottle of wine, which I then sanitized on his doorstep, knocked on his door, um, walked off, and he took it. And um, we, had a, we had a brief chat. And it was, a, it, was a, it was amazing because we got to connect in a different way. But um, he didn't come to Alpha, but he has started coming to church on the odd occasion. And we, the, and the bigger thing for me was, man, God is at work in the world around me. And when I ask the Lord what he's doing and saying, and I, and I partner with that in a, in a, a, in a practical, tangible way, that in itself, in that moment, it actually narrows the gap there and then. Another one of my friends, he, he was praying for, for his mate, Keith, who did come, did come to the Alpha course. He was following up with all sorts of kind of prophetic words. And Keith, who was a total atheist, um, but uh, I finished Alpha, did all 10 weeks of Alpha, um, and has then agreed to come to the prayer course that we're running. And during the Does God Heal Today week, he got, he got healed. It was totally, felt totally unremarkable. 
He's just had a sore shoulder as a plasterer. And then we prayed for him. And the next day on the WhatsApp group, he's like, oh yeah, my, my shoulder's better. And it's like, oh, Keith, that's really awkward for you, mate, isn't it? That the God you don't believe in has just healed you. And so we've got an ongoing conversation. It's so amazing when we confess Jesus to those around us. Um, and it helps us see how big and good God is and it helps us step into our calling. If we want to narrow the gap between who God's called us to be, who God says we are, and how we are actually living, then those three types of confession will help us step, step into that. And um, in a moment, I think Rebecca is just is gonna take over from us, but I just had, a, a, um, as I was praying for you guys, the sense that I had was that, um, that for, many, for, for some of you guys there, that um, the confession is going to be a bit like um, using a broom to sweep a very dusty floor. And that as you, as you sweep the dust off the dusty floor, it goes into the air and it, it results in some coughing, some spluttering. But in the end, you can sweep the dust out of the house and it is a cleaner, better place to live. They're the kind of dust clouds that were being scuffed up just from day-to-day -day activity, that they don't happen anymore because the room has been swept clean. And uh, that's my prayer for, for, for you guys. It's my prayer for, for myself that, um, uh, that the gap gets narrowed and that we experience the blood of Jesus purifying us in every way. So we yeah, do not live coughing and spluttering so much, but are freer and more whole. Amen.